Welcome back to the podcast. This week, we've got a treat. John Burns from John Burns Consulting and Research. They really do a, you know, a lot of consulting in our business, in the real estate business, are an expert uh, on builders. You're going to hear that from John, and, and, and he's really going to talk about a couple of things that are important. First, can builders resolve the inventory challenges that we face right now of undersupply across the country too. He's going to talk about what's happening in the overall economy. Uh, you're going to want to listen for that. And he hits on what's ahead. So listen up. This is a great episode and let's jump in with John. John, I'm excited uh, to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for joining. My pleasure, David. Well, you know, uh, you and I have gotten to know each other. We quote John Burns Consulting often, you know, at Keeping Current Matters. We're grateful for all the great work that you do. Um, you and your team are experts in the housing industry, certainly with builders. But for somebody that maybe doesn't know John Burns, John Burns Consulting and Research, tell them what, what all your team does. Well, we, we figured out a long time ago that the industry takes a lot of risk and nobody really spends the money to pay attention to what's going on in the market because it's time consuming. So uh, we started a business to do that, just like you did. But we, yeah. did, for, we did it for big companies, not, not for real estate agents. So the biggest home builders in America, biggest private equity investors, building, biggest building product companies, all rely on us to figure out what's going on in the market to help them with their business plan. So we, we got a boatload of data. <laughs> yeah, well, we know that. We, we know that. We share it. We, we try to get the message out there and say, hey, you're doing great work. And so we, we're, we're grateful for that. I know there are a lot of folks across the country that are grateful for all the great work you do. How, how'd you get into, into the business? What'd you do prior to starting your own firm? Um, I worked at KPFG, that big accounting uh, that, that yeah. probably, uh, consulting firm. And uh, I was in the real estate consulting group for 10 years. And uh, I learned a lot of how to do this in the commercial real estate world. And I just figured out the residential world really wasn't doing it. It actually was a little bit harder. So I started the business 22 years ago and uh, we've been slow and steady ever since. Yeah, that's great. Well, I mean, seeing an opportunity and then taking advantage of it and saying, hey, we can do this for residential. That, that's a neat story. Well, when you think about starting 20 years ago, and I want to get into, I think, the topic that a lot of people are curious about right now, and that's lack of inventory and you know the undersupply across the country. But if you go back 20 years ago to the early 2000s, can you talk a little bit about that journey of inventory and kind of how we got to the place that we're at? Because I think a lot of agents look up and go, how did we end up here? I mean, certainly know the last couple of years and extreme demand, but I'd love to just hear you tell that story of, of what that's been like for the last you know 20 years leading up to today. Yeah, well, I started the company right after 9-11, which was an interesting time to, to start a company. It was pretty slow for a while there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when the early 2000s happened and there were a lot of investors going on and the subprime market was crazy and I was pretty fortunate. I had I had a, a friend who was running a mortgage business and I had a person I know who was selling mortgages. I was like, this is just crazy. And, and, and the fundamentals didn't look very good. A lot of smart people were saying this doesn't make sense, but it just kept going up and up and up. Um, you know, we obviously know what happened then. But I think the biggest change to answer your question is Dodd Frank came in and the industry basically hated it. But Dodd Frank was a government regulation that basically said, we're not going to allow this to happen anymore. So mortgages need to be properly documented. You can't give somebody an adjustable rate mortgage anymore that could rise to an interest rate where they can't make the payment. Put the mortgage company through hell documentation wise, frankly. But now we're sitting pretty from a mortgage standpoint is that people can afford their mortgages. Right. Um, and I think that's very underappreciated because a lot of people are wondering, when's the distress got to come? When's the supply got to come? That's actually what's restricting supply is there's there's really very little distress and very little potential for distress because everybody who owns a mortgage was properly under it. Um, so what what's... What we've been talking about my entire career was well, what happens if interest rates rise permanently? Everybody's got to stay in their house. It was always a theoretical thing. You never knew how many people would actually move anyway. And now we're finding out the hard way that people just have really got a great asset. 
which is my low rate mortgage. And um, so it's it's a challenge for them to move. The other sure. thing that's happened, we, we wrote a book on demographics in 2016 called Big Shifts Ahead. But there's a demographic aspect to this too, David, where um, the baby boomers now are all hitting, or all their 60s or later. We've actually got 34 million people that own a house free and clear of no mortgage. Right. So, so it's, they, they don't have that asset we're talking about. The asset they have is 100% equity, but they're just very patient buyers. Never any urgency to move, really. The urgency, as we've studied it, is really the kids and the grandkids now live somewhere else. That's what's going to cause me to move. Right. Right. That's kind of how we ended up where we're at. Yeah, it's interesting you bring in the the Dodd Frank uh, element, and absolutely came in. And you know, I always thought about that when the qualified mortgage came out. The basis of the qualified mortgage was the ability to repay. Right? right if we're going right. to give somebody a loan, we want to make sure they can pay it. Um, I also think, and I'm interested in your perspective on this. One of the things that became abundantly clear to me in the last couple of years, as we reflected back on 2008 is people made a decision, we're going to do it differently this time. We're not going to harvest equity. We're not going to, you know, sort of be speculative in the essence of, um, you know, thinking, you know, I think Ben Bernanke coined the term irrational exuberance in the housing market back in 2008. And certainly there were some some crazy times over the last couple of years that felt a lot like that. But just the amount of equity in homes and the way people have handled equity has been dramatically different than that time. Would you agree with that? Is that a fair assessment? Um, yeah. And uh, I think it was Greenspan who did the irrational exuberance. There, there's there's still been plenty of rational exuberance out there. It's sure. just tested in other ways. Right. You, you've, you've seen the eye buyer business, the open doors and the offer pads and all of that come in. Right. They haven't turned a profit yet either, right? The, the fix and flip business now is huge. Uh, that's taking a lot of risk. And, and we've seen a lot of the irrational exuberance really in venture capital investments and other things. Yeah. But um, And I think there'd be, I think we would have a lot of explodable, adjustable rates, subprime-like mortgages all over again right now, if not for regulations. And I'm not a big fan of regulations, but this one uh, is is going to make the housing market more of a stable environment permanently. Yeah. Well, what about the role builders have played? So I've always thought about you know the builders and you know kind of gearing up, kind of to your point with demand being inflated back in two thousand and eight. A lot of builders got out of the business in the early part of 2010, 11, 12, I think. I'd love to hear your perspective on that and kind of have been gearing up coming into this market for the last, you know, eight years, 10 years, whatever it's been. Yeah, so we uh, we navigated the builders through that, so we know all quite well what happened. Um, I mean, those that were, I'm sure there's a high correlation between getting our research and be caring about what's going on and not sure, being right. much risk. Most of our clients made it through. A lot of other ones did not. But the ones that made it through made it through with a lot of battle scars. And um, as they came out of it, they they said, I'm not going to be buying eight years of land at a time. I'm not going to be borrowing everything I can to grow, grow, grow. The, the whole building industry is a completely different business. It is extremely disciplined with uh, no crazy debt, great balance sheets. Uh, I mean, you and um, right now they're they're killing it because the lack of resale supply is pushing everybody to the new home market. And then the changes in life and people working from home, they're designing homes for that too. So that the home builders are really, really doing well right now. And, and yeah. you know, I don't, I don't want, you know, mortgage rates go from three to seven. They don't like that. So I don't want to make it super Pollyanna, but they're still making money and they're not concerned about going out of business uh, even though um, sales may be flat. Right. Well, well certainly we, we saw in the time we're recording this podcast, Warren Buffett you know, was kind of on, on the news everywhere of making significant investments in builders, publicly traded builders. Well, I, I could talk a lot about that, actually. So Warren Buffett owns the eighth largest production builder in the comp- country called Clayton Properties and owns the largest manufactured home of the company, country called Clayton Homes, which owns 50,000 homes a year. So he he knows home building, uh, and actually, I'll tell you a fun story related to this. This is a podcast. Yeah. So, um, 
Tim Eller was the CEO of Centex in 2006, the third largest home builder in the country, built 37,000 homes a year. He was from Omaha and caught, found himself at a charity poker event sitting next to Warren Buffett in 2006. So here the third largest home builder turns to Warren Buffett and says, I just got to ask, why don't you own any of our stock? <laughs> this <laughs> right. is the guy who owned Clayton at the, at the time. And Warren told him, here's your balance sheet. And particularly, they were also a lender and owned a lot of subprime mortgages. Yeah, CTX mortgage back in the day. Right, yeah. right. So uh, he sold all his subprime before subprime exploded, thanks to a charity poker event. <laughs> um, but, you know, Warren Buffett is now, he and I've studied him quite a bit, he invests in companies that are very well run, that have great balance sheets, very high market share. None of the home builders had that last time. The three home builder stocks he bought, those three home builders combined sell one out of every four homes in America right wow. now. And in the smile states, it's probably two out of three. Or I mean it's really, really high. And they're they're buying down mortgage rates. They're 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 literally buy they're selling homes with a five and a half percent mortgage rate right now. We're recording this mortgage rates of seven yeah. because they're paying the points up front to get the mortgage rate down permanently and still making a lot of money. And um, have virtually no debt on their balance sheets, and that's the type of company Warren Buffett likes to own. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a great story. I appreciate you sharing that and uh, and and hearing that. And you know, I think his his you know investment philosophy has always been: I'm going to invest in things I understand and fundamentally right. uh, that that match what what I want. So that makes a lot of sense. Here's the question: I think it's on the minds of a lot of agents. So, you know, folks listening, can home builders get us out of the inventory? You know, you, depending on who you look at the under supply across the country or what's your perspective on that? Oh, why we've done a whole white paper on that and everybody's definition of under supply is different. Right. Um, so I'll just give you ours. Our, ours would be from a shelter standpoint. Like if we if you look at the vacancy in the country out there, is it tighter or lower than than usual? People don't think about vacant homes. Uh, the number of adults per household is it higher or lower than usual? Looking at a by age cohort, um, we're short about 1.7 million homes, um, and we need every year we need to add about 1.7 million homes. Coincidentally, so we'd have to you know, do 2 million for a year after year after year to get rid of that 1.7 million. Um, that would be challenging. Uh, I think this work from home shift is helping a lot, quite a bit though, because it's allowing people to buy a little further from work. If I only have to come in two or three days a week and that's where the land is. But the other part of your question is, you know, when demand and supplier out of whack, prices adjust. Right. And so um, prices have adjusted and I'm not sure, you know, all those 1.7 million people can afford a house right now because right. it's damn expensive. So um, that's my long-winded answer. I think they can. I think they can get the shelter very slowly, uh, but we need incomes to grow faster than mortgage payments for a while in order for affordability to. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear that, and I think that um, that issue right now is the one that's on the top minds of many agents is how do I guide my clients forward given that? And I think what I, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but certainly the outlook for U.S. residential real estate, I think is strong in the coming years, right? So if you can afford it, it's a great time to buy, but the challenge is affordability. Yeah, but you got to add, you know, are you, are you buying this as an investment or a place to live? Let's assume somebody's buying it to live. Yeah. So what are you waiting for? Yeah, right. Um, you know, you got to rent for six or seven more years to try to time it right. I mean, my wife and I bought in 1991 our first house, 15% below the price in 1989 because it was a distressed position. We sold it five years later in a loss. Hmm. Was I upset? I'm like, no, I didn't want to rent for those five years. And then we sold that and bought another house that had also come down during that time period. And so right. for me, you can't look at every house as a trade. You 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 get in and you live. And if you don't have a steady job or you don't think you're going to be in your metro area for a long time, then maybe that's a reason not to buy. But um, if you think you're going to be set, 
sit for a while and you can afford the payment, I avoid, I encourage everybody to get in because mortgage rates could go up. And if they go down, you just refund. Right. So, you know, what you're trying to try with the mortgage rate thing to, you don't need to time it because you can always refinance. What do you see? It's such a, such a good point. And that's what I feel like we uh, try to be advocates for that vocally in the market for agents to, to say, hey, when, when's the best time to buy a home? It certainly um, was yesterday. Um, and, and if you have that long-term hold uh, approach or you're looking for uh, shelter, not, not to flip or, or something like that, now is, is a great time. What do you see coming over the next year? What's ahead? You know, if you kind of look into your crystal ball, what what would you say? Um, boy, that's always a tough one. So, so I I don't foresee a lot of supply coming on the market. So that's probably not what your clients want to hear. But it's because of the Dodd Frank mortgages underwriting everything so well that there's just there's not a lot of impetus to move. I mean, I, I do think supply can come up. Um, I don't think housing is going to cause any sort of problems in the economy at all. I do think the Fed is and in, in rising interest rates are going to break other sectors in the economy. It just right. hasn't broken yet. And so th- there may be some layoffs and, and other things associated with that. So there, there may be some softness in the market that won't cause supply to pick up a little bit, but it, it shouldn't be distressed supply. Yeah. That's what D- we're doing. Clients plan, plan, plan for that. Just Play it safe. Something bad's probably got to happen outside the industry, but the industry is in okay shape. Yeah. What does that mean when you're giving that advice to a publicly traded builder or a, a client of yours? What does that mean for them? What decisions do they make differently? Um, they're not going long. So so they won't buy a 10-year land supply. They'll buy three. And in fact, what they're actually doing is they're actually finding the land they want and finding somebody else to buy it for them and and purchasing an option agreement to buy the lots when they need it and paying that person a reasonable return to do it. They're just playing it super safe. So no right. matter what happens, they're prepared. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you think, um, I'm interested in your perspective on this, what gets this market, what frees up inventory? Because my thought is we see a little bit of relief and a little bit's a relative term, but we see uh, mortgage rates coming down in the next couple of years. That will then free up some inventory, existing home sales. But but would you agree with that statement? Yeah, no, I, uh, the bond market is forecasting that, that uh, rates should come down a little bit. So if the bond market's right, that is, that is correct. I, I think the longer you have a interest rate above five or above six or above seven, people start to settle in. Right. I remember my dad bragging that he had a 6% mortgage rate, you know, that he got in the early 70s during the 80s. He was bragging how what a great rate it was. So right. um, there's some psychology that just takes a while to play in. But at the end of the day, it's the payment in relation to people's income uh, that, re- that really matters, as, as you know. Yeah, yeah. What's what your – because I, I think if you think about that, you think about you know the long-term look, and I'm going to say long-term right now through the end of this year and next year. MBA, most forecasts are that rates will start to come down, certainly as we go through next year. You think about that relative to affordability, I think that bodes well prices being, I'm going to say, flatter, not you know rising to the degree they have in the last couple of years – interest rates coming down, and certainly wages have been improving, right? So that bodes well for affordability. How do you, what's the research behind that to articulate that story of, of you know, the, the affordability path going forward? Yeah. Well, I, we, we actually wrote a book on the income growth side of that. So it, uh, the, we wrote a book in 2016 called Big Chefs Ahead that was really understanding the demographics for business people. Um, and what I do not think most people appreciate, you, you, all the way up to the Fed, because they don't pay as much attention to demographics as they should, is our labor force is not growing. Hmm. For years, when I was in my 20s and 30s and 40s, there were 4 million people entering the workforce every year from high school or college, and 2 million people retiring. That number now is 4 4. It's even... Because retirement is so high. So um, 
we're going to have a very low unemployment rate for that reason for a very long time. Even if we have a lot of recession, we're not dumping all this new labor into the market at the same time. That is going to support income growth. And you're seeing the smart companies figure that out right now. When Home Depot just announced that they're putting a billion dollars extra into wage growth this year. Um, because every time somebody gets a rent hike at Home Depot, they look for more income or they leave. Right. And, and so I do think we're going to start to see, we're going to see some pretty steady, eddy, strong income growth for quite some time. Mortgage rates, hard to figure out. The best agents know what's happening nationally and also know what's going on in their local market. At Keeping Current Matters, we help real estate agents become experts. And now we've added something that will change the way you communicate. KCM Local. With KCM Local, you'll now have access to local data, national insights, and powerful visuals all in one place. To be the local expert, visit KeepingCurrentMatters.com. What do you see uh, um, right now? And I don't know how much your company talks with real estate companies and agents. I know we're doing a survey together. And so anybody listening, that'll be coming out. Be on the lookout for that to, to really get a pulse of what's you know what's happening at the agent and broker level. You do some of that now. But give us perspective of where you see companies that are making a difference out in the market where they're making it. Uh, and things are doing really well. I don't know if you ha- if you have that as part of your research. Or well, that's a big can of worms. Because <laughs> you've got Compass come in and be very disruptive and, and a lot of things. Um, it's it's basically discipline. I mean, I I think if you're if you're sitting around all day waiting, hoping for mortgage rates to go up or more listings to come on the market, you're wasting your time. I, I mean, you keep, you just gotta make those sales calls and be super smart. Uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of what you guys do. I got my sister-in-law who's a real estate agent. And I remember, yeah. To get it, and she loves that. And be the expert in your market. I mean, that set yourself apart and uh, do do those videos. And, and, you know, whether we got 4 million resales a year or five or six, you're going to get your fair share of that. Yeah, that is, it's so important. I mean, it's one of the things we say all the time, control what you can control. You know, in this business, every day, it gets clouded. It gets confusing. Um, well, here's here's what I believe. If somebody's got to pick an agent, they're going to do a little homework. Right. And if one of your competitors, they're finding some videos that they're doing or some other things, and they're appear to be pretty knowledgeable on the market, and the video thing now is like, I feel like I know this person after I've watched three or four videos from them, and you're not that person, you're going to lose market share. Right. I mean, what, who's, who picks an agent without doing a little homework on the agent? Right. No, that's such a brilliant point. What are the things right now, John, um, that you see maybe companies or our business not paying attention to that we need to pay attention to? Um, that's a good question. I, I think probably the biggest thing, and I, and I don't want to be a, a Debbie Downer here, though, is, is we just went through, since the great financial crisis, a lot of risk-taking around the world. Yeah. And all the venture capital investments and all the unicorn companies and uh, private equity completely exploded. There's a lot of companies out there with too much debt, and it's all adjustable rate. Uh, there's a lot of office buildings and apartment complexes with too much debt, and it's all adjustable rate. So I, I think there's a lot of distress coming our way outside of housing that right. would impact the economy that, that um, you know, it should, it sh- you know, if, if it happens, it should reduce housing demand even more, bring supply up a little bit. Um, but you just got to be prepared for that. The, the other thing I, I think that nobody's talking about that is a super positive in this industry is uh, we talk so much about all the people who aren't moving because they've got a great 3% or less mortgage rate. Right. There's 34 million homeowners that do not have a mortgage at all. So it's 100% equity. Right. So they're, they're not worried about, you know, they may not like the fact that if they were going to buy something more expensive, um, they need to get a 6% mortgage, or if they were going to cash out and retire or something more cheaper, cheap, they'd have to get a 6% mortgage for some of that to cash out. Um, 
But th- that's a lot of wealth and a lot of pent up demand there. Somebody who's probably living in an old tired home that they don't want to live. In. Yeah, it's such a such a great point. You know, the number of homes that are owned free and clear. We talk a lot about that at KCM of interfacing with those people. Um, I have a, you brought something up that that I want to ask you about. You talked about distress in other areas of the economy. Yep. So one, agents hear that and go, how do I prepare for that? Because sometimes I think we, you know, when anybody ever hears the word recession, they think 2008 because, you know, in our business caused the recession then. It will will not be the cause of a recession this time. But is there anything that – you would say an agent can do, be the expert, no doubt, but a, as other areas of the economy maybe experience challenge? Well, they, they need to know what the job drivers are in their local market. And, um, you know, if, like I'll use the tech market right now. The tech okay. market's clearly going through a lot of distress. And right. if you're in Austin, Texas, or the San Francisco Bay Area, you're impacted by that. Somebody's losing their job. So, they, so they, they, they may have a ton of equity in the house, but they're not having the income to keep making the payment. Maybe they want to become a renter. Um, you know, you should be talking to those people. Some, some of them may be deciding to sell for one reason or another. Um, I, I think that's really about all you, you can do, though, David. It's just sure. a story. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think your point of what's driving the local economy – Understanding that, being prepared for it, but also having relationships in other areas where somebody might be moving, right? If you're in Austin and you lose your job in, in tech, you might be going somewhere else. Or So those relationships I see as being critically important. Well, that, that's another reason to be online. Yeah. Because if, if I'm relocating to Orlando, how am I going to find my agent? Yeah, right. right. It's not like my neighbor used the agent because I'm relocating. So if you're at a heavy relocation market, it's even more important to be out there socially. And our our clients who sell a lot of retirement homes in particular say that is that is critical. And those yeah, yeah. buyers may come back twelve times and you may spend a lot of time with them. But right. um they have the money to buy. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. Other thing you said that I'm very interested in your perspective on. What is your firm's take and yours on the debate, and I don't know if it's a debate, but theory in work from home being bigger, obviously through COVID, empty office space, is that an area for residential growth? Because I've heard people on both sides of that argument. Yeah. Um, the, the office market is down for the count. I, I would put a 99% probability on that. Okay. So um, to, there's a lot of discussion about office conversions to residential. The, the only way that makes sense is if you're buying the office building for pennies on the dollar. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it really, it's just, it's just too expensive. So I think yeah. there, there's a lot of discussion about that. But I think the big work from home opportunity is an opportunity for the suburbs and the exurbs. And that is an affordability solution that is going on today. Is, is somebody said, I can't afford to buy in this area because I need to be 30 minutes from work. Now I can go 45 minutes from work because I only have to go in three days a week, or maybe I don't need to go in at all. Huge affordability solution. Right. That actually favors the new home market a bit too because the land tends to be in the outlying areas. And, you know, we've leaned, we were doing this before COVID. Uh, we just look for the best people and put the guardrails in place to show us you're doing a great job and you'll be fine. Our staff's been moving all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's been a great affordability solutions for them. And, and I, I, you know, the only, the people who don't think that is, that don't think work from home works is people my generation who thinks you have to be rubbing elbows in the office. This right. generation grew up talking to their friends like you and I are talking online right now. They're very comfortable interacting with us. Yeah. No, I think it's a good point. I mean, and, and it seems to me you could – I think you probably have the research to confirm this, that you know that type of migration is happening 
in different ways in different markets, right? Land availability is not the same right. in every area. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Because that migration out of a population center or even not having to be in an area that you have a job in it used to be, you know, I can remember you used to qualify for a mortgage that way, right? How far are you from your, um, for your place of employment? And they would question that at times, unless you right. had a truly remote job. But, but talk about the nuances in different parts of the country. Well, what's happening right now, and we're seeing it play out in our business too, because we do about a thousand consulting studies a year, and a lot of them are pro- property specific for builders that are going to build something. Their growth is all in the small markets. Mm-hmm. The small markets did not see 50% home price appreciation in three years. And, and the small markets are generally nice places to live. <laughs> And right. people are figuring, and word is getting out. So um, I, I think some of the, the, and you're seeing this, the population growth in big metro areas is pretty anemic compared to the population growth in, in small areas. I'm even talking about the Midwest. This doesn't just yeah. be where the sun shines all the time. Right, right. Is that the equivalent of, or corollary from moving from a high cost to a low cost market? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, it's like, look how much I can get for my money Jill. Right, right. It's, I mean, it's, it's amazing all the ways that COVID spurred on a lot of that and spurred on a lot of that change. What do you think 20 years from now we'll look back on this market and say how COVID, not only in the world, but in our business, dramatically changed things? Well, it, it accelerated the adoption of a lot of technology that it was already occurring. We we were using Zoom before COVID, right? You know, it just it it excel. I think it accelerated a trend. Basically, uh, it probably brought a permanent death. Well, not permanent death, but a, it caused a lot of distress in the office market. Right. You're gonna you're gonna see a lot of distressed banks and, and commercial real estate companies there. Yeah, so, on the on the horizons, what you're saying, or, or yeah, coming. most of yeah. them. Their debt matures like it's an adjustable rate for maybe about three years, and then it and then it adjust. I mean, it's fixed for three years, and then it's adjusts. And after five or seven years, frequently you have to refinance. So there's a there's a lot of companies out there are in properties that are just kind of sit. They're zombies waiting to um, deal with their day of wreck. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. So we'll look back and we'll say, you know, the last time we the great financial crisis, that was the subprime crisis. I think we're going to look back 20 years from now and say this was the office crisis. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. I I, I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, the, the, the research and perspective you have is uh, is phenomenal, and it, and it makes sense uh, in, in where we're at. Um, John, I am so grateful for just all the great work that you and your team do. Um, in, in helping, whether agents know it or not, they're kind of beneficiaries of that through companies and through you know organizations that use it. Um, so know that we're grateful uh, for that. As we kind of wrap up, you know, you think about this business, you think about things that, um, you know, you've mentioned being the expert, using information to go out and make a difference in your market. As you think about coming issues and, and things that are out there relative to um, uh, you know, opportunities in the market relative to, you know, new builds and things like that. If you were talking to an agent right now that maybe doesn't have builder relationships, maybe doesn't have a business that's, um, that, that's widespread like that, what's the best way to connect with a builder in this market? I think if you acknowledge their beefs a little bit, I think you'd go a long way. So they, they, and, I, and I'm, I, this is going to sound pretty negative, but I'm not meaning it that way. This is how they say it. Like, We're building a brand new house. Yeah. There's no inspection issues. There's, if we don't negotiate, you know, we're, you're going to get a 10 year warranty if you're worried about it. There's not a lot of value the resale agent brings to the table, um, is their view. So okay. I think if you can say, you know what, I I I have pretty good certainty of closing here. Um, I'm not, I'm not really bringing that much value other than I do have a buyer. I'm willing to take a little bit lower commission because I'm working less. Um, 
I think that would go a long way. And I also mm. know with the research, there's, you got to be patient to get the commission because sometimes it takes the home six months to get finished. Right. Um, you know, I, I think if you understand where their mindset is, it's going to help you uh, be their favorite uh, resale agent of choice, if you yeah. will. Yeah, I appreciate that. And certainly, I think agents listing know that, and there's been this tension between builders and agents and even some tough stories, you know, um, of agents who feel like they put the work in and help bring a buyer and, you know, have a, have a feeling like that. Um, as we wrap up, we've got uh, – it was not the purpose of this podcast, but I'll bring it up. You mentioned it. We've got a, um, a a survey that we're going to do together and get out there to, to, to folks. Um, what it, talk just a minute about that, what people can expect, and how when we give that back to them, it helps them in their business. Can you talk just a minute about that? Yeah. So, so for us to figure out what's going on in the housing market, we collect a lot of data and we talk to a lot of people and the resale margin market is more than 80% of the market. So we've been doing right. a resale agent survey for a while now, more than a thousand agent participates, it takes less than five minutes. You can do it super easy on your phone and we'll feed back to them through you some data you can use to post and, and probably some good color that would help you think through what's going on in the market, just seeing what the other 1,000-plus resale agents are saying, too. And just, I'll, I'll, we have three indices we do. One is saying demand supply out of 0 to 100 is at an 86. So demand is outstripping supply. The other is saying sales volume is at a 26. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so net-net, the industry's kind of feeling the index is coming out on a 55. But that's probably how you feel. But we, we will be monitoring that demand supply with your help and the listings with your help and hopefully making you look smarter so you get the listing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's some, too, correct me if I'm wrong in that, some benchmarking, too, relative to activity in the market, meaning what's the average agent doing in the market and where you sit with that. Is that fair? Um. Yeah, well, we're, I mean, we're, we're pulling more than a thousand resale agents. You can see what the averages and the medians are there. And yeah. uh, actually, some of the color, like the commentary, is is the best part. Right, right. That's good stuff. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And if you're listening to this, you're a KCM member, you're connected to KCM, you'll get a chance to participate in that. So we want you to do that. Um, John, I am grateful for the time. All, I mentioned it before, all the hard work that you and your team do uh, to get great information out in the market. So know that we are grateful for that. Well, thanks, David. And I, I appreciate what you're doing too, because I, I firmly believe that agents that are using you are going to have a competitive advantage. So absolutely we're grateful for it and grateful for all that you do thank you thanks for tuning into this episode of how's the market you know it's great to have john burns on he's a wealth of information we covered so much in that short amount of time you know at keeping current matters we believe every family should feel confident when buying and selling a home and that's our aim through this podcast so if you liked it um, please like this episode subscribe to the podcast and share it with anybody that you believe could benefit see you next time